let me read to you from Colossians chapter 1. I'm going to read from verse 24 down to the early part of chapter 2. Colossians 1.24, Paul says, Now I rejoice in what was suffered for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations but is now disclosed to the saints. To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We proclaim him, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. To this end I labor, struggling with all his energy which so powerfully works in me. I want you to know how much I'm struggling for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not met me personally. My purpose is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. That's where we're going to stop. Paul often speaks of himself as being a servant, usually as a servant of Jesus Christ. It's a phrase he often uses when he introduces his letters. And of course, it's a good description of an apostle. It's a good description of anyone involved in Christian service. In fact, it's a good description of any Christian, a servant of Jesus Christ. But here in Colossians chapter 1, in the verse I just read to you, he adds two more descriptions of his servanthood. In verse 23, middle of that verse, he says, I am a servant of the gospel. Let me read it to you. This is the gospel that you heard, and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven, and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. It's not my gospel. I'm a servant of the gospel. And then in verse 24 and 25, he says, I'm a servant of the church. Because he talks about the body of Christ, which is the church in verse 24, and then says in verse 25, I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness. Presenting the word of God in its fullness is what it means to be a servant of the church. So the pattern is this. To be a servant of Jesus Christ is to be a servant of the church. To be a servant of the church is to be a servant of the gospel. And to be a servant of the gospel means to present the word of God in its fullness. Not the bits that we like, but in its fullness. And that's what this section is about. And in these verses, he tells us how the word of God comes to its place of fullness, which is his word. Now, he doesn't mean there fullness as in full volume, full content, because, of course, there is lots and lots of that. This whole Bible, this whole scripture contains the fullness of the word of God. But he's speaking here of the fullness of the word of God in the sense of its climax, in the sense of its goal, in the sense of its highest pinnacle, in the sense at which everything else is leading to this point of fullness. And that fullness, which we'll see in just a moment, involves what Paul calls a mystery. That's the word he uses. Now I'm sure that many of us are tempted to say, too right. You know, this book is a mystery. I try to read it, it's hard to understand it, it doesn't always seem to make sense, it's sometimes very confusing. But Paul says to preach the word of God in his fullness is actually to crack the mystery. To preach this fullness, this pinnacle of the word of God, is to understand something which unlocks and cracks what otherwise is a mystery 
to the rest of Scripture. And that's why he says, I became its servant by the commission, in verse 25, I became its servant by the commission God gave me to present you the word of God in its fullness, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the saints. Let me pause there a moment. He says there are things that extend through ages and through generations that in themselves have not made sense. Something hasn't added up. When you go back into your Old Testament scriptures, you read some of the great stories and you say, well, it's all very well. God called Abraham, God called Moses and all their stories. But, you know, what is it really all about? When, when you look at the law that God gave to Moses on Mount Sinai and all the explanation of the law, you say it, it really is very confusing to me. When I look at the tabernacle and all the detail about the priesthood and the sacrifices and the tabernacle itself and the temple that folded, I mean, all this is mysterious. I try to read the prophets and it's like reading a book backwards. It doesn't make sense. But of course it doesn't. Until you've cracked the mystery. By which then you go back and you read it and you find it makes sense. You know, we apply the word mystery most frequently to um, whodunit situations. You know, movies or books. I, I don't know if you ever read Agatha Christie. She's the only movie, uh, the only uh, detective mystery series that I've read. I read a few other individual books. And, of course, she has a whole set that followed Miss Marple. Do you remember Miss Marple? Who was a quite unassuming lady who lives alone in the little village of St. Mary Mead. And uh, she's very observant. And it's a little village with a very high proportion of murders because every book is about another one. Of course, the police run off in the wild goose chases and Miss Marple gets in their way, she's a nuisance to them, but she reads the clues, and in the last chapter she gets everybody together in the room, and there's usually a major or a colonel, uh, and there's a doctor, and there's an heiress, and there's an actress, and all these kind of individuals who have played roles all the way through, and all of which would have had a reason to commit the murder, and she gets them all together, and she announces who is the murderer, and then why they committed the murder. Now, by sheer fluke, I've once or twice guessed who the right person is, but never for the right reason. But when Miss Marple explains it, you suddenly say, aha, okay, that makes sense now. Now I know why the carving knife was missing from the breadboard in the cook's pantry. <laughs> and if you were to read the story again, which you wouldn't do because you know what happens at the end, but if you were to read it again, a lot of little incidental things which, when you read them, seemed of absolutely no or little significance, suddenly are alive with meaning. Because you know the mystery. You crack the mystery. Now, it's not that the scripture is kind of an Agatha Christie mystery. The word mystery is really meaning an unveiling, that there is a slowly coming to light something. God's revelation is progressive. That doesn't mean that it progresses from half-truths to whole-truths, but it's progressive in the sense that it progresses from promise to fulfillment. There are clues dotted all the way through about, about what God is really all about, and they come to their fulfillment at some point. And when they come to that fulfillment, then you go back and you read again the Old Testament passages, and they make sense. And the whole of the Old Testament is as alive as the New Testament when you understand the mystery. Now what is this mystery? Paul makes this grand statement in verse 26 about the Word of God in its fullness, in its climax, which involves the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations but is now disclosed to the saints. There have been clues all the way along which we now understand when we go back but which we didn't understand at the time. And this mystery, he says, this climax, this pinnacle, he reduces to seven words. Let me read verse 27. To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ 
in you the hope of glory. Let me look at that with you. I want to look at four things from those words. And remember, we're dealing with not just one element of truth, we're dealing with the fullness of the Word of God, according to Paul. The pinnacle. The means by which the mystery is cracked and the rest of Scripture makes sense. First of all, it's about a person. The first word is Christ. The first word of the Word of God in its fullness is Christ. Now, when we speak of the Word of God, we may speak of the Word of God in two ways. This, I hold in my hand, this book is the Word of God. Given under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to individual people, of course, whose own personality is there in the pages, but it has its source in God, which is why it is utterly trustworthy and utterly sufficient. But Scripture speaks in a second way, too. If you go to John's Gospel, chapter 1 and verse 1, John introduces his Gospel, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He's talking there, of course, of the Word of God being Christ himself. Christ himself is the Word. Christ himself is the message. Christ himself is the truth. As he said, I am the truth. And the difference between the written Word of God and the living Word of God, Christ, is that Scripture is true. And I hope you'll listen to this and understand it. Scripture is true, but it is not the truth. Jesus Christ is the truth. Now, Scripture is true. But if you ever detach Scripture at any point from Jesus Christ himself, it'll remain true, but it won't take you to the truth. In Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 1 and 2, the writer says this, In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son. He spoke through the prophets, our Old Testament scriptures. But now God's revelation is in his Son, the truth. Here in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 2, just a couple of verses on, Paul says, My purpose is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love, so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding, in order that they may know the mystery of God. What is that? The mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. That's why if we're to be faithful in teaching the Word of God, we will always find it takes us back to Christ. As all roads lead to Rome, as all arteries and veins will take you to your heart, all Scripture takes you to Christ. He is the truth to which it is bearing witness. When I began preaching many years ago now, the man who was my boss, when I asked him if I had a job description, he said yes. It's two words long. Preach Christ. Period. And he said to me, if ever you deviate from that, you'll be out of a job. Preach Christ. He is our message. And that's why I have asked of every sermon I preach, and I always do and I still do, I ask of every sermon I preach, what am I saying about Christ? Why? Because the Word of God in its fullness, the Word of God in its fullness, which is the pinnacle of God's revelation, which cracks the mystery, is namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures a wisdom and knowledge, everything derives from him. So the first thing about this uh, mystery is it's about a person, it's about Christ. Secondly, it's about a place. Christ in you is Paul's phrase. 
What's new about that? The answer is everything is new about that. In the Old Testament, they had known God with them. This is something more. They had known God for them. This is something more. This is now Christ in them, lived in us by the Holy Spirit. Previously, God was with people and for people, but now he's in people. Jesus in the upper room, when he met with them the night before he was, or the night he was arrested, in John 14, one of the things he said to them about preparing for the future, he talked about the Holy Spirit, and he said of the Holy Spirit, he lives with you, that's his present role, but he will be in you. Peter, as long as you only know the life of God with you, you'll go on being the failure that you've shown yourself to be for the past three years. Because Peter was always tripping over himself, remember? And that very night, despite the fact Peter's saying, if I have to die with you, I'll never disown you, this very night before the rooster crows to welcome in the new day, you'll deny me three times, said Jesus. You are utterly powerless, Peter. But something's going to happen. Something's going to happen. John? You're the nice, warm, kind, sentimental one. You put your head on my shoulder. <laughs> you say, I'm the, you're the one that I love. John, one day you're going to find yourself in Isle of Patmos in an environment of hostility and persecution. But you'll have what it takes because he's with you now. He's going to be in you. This, of course, is what makes a person a true Christian. In 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 5, Paul writes this, Examine yourselves to see whether you're in the faith. Test yourselves. Now, what kind of test would you expect? Not test your doctrine, not test your belief, test yourselves, examine yourselves. And then he says this, Do you not realize that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless you fail the test. You know, when I became a Christian, I knew the language about this. Christ coming into your heart was the way we used to talk about it. I had no idea it was real. For the first years of my Christian life, my basic understanding was that when I became a Christian, God gave me several things. And... In retrospect, in hindsight, I see them in this picture language, which I'll give to you. I saw that God had given to me a ticket, a certificate, and a catalogue. Let me explain what I mean. The ticket said, one way to heaven. I knew I was going to heaven. The certificate said, this is to certify that Charles Price has had all his sins forgiven, signed God. And you had been forgiven. In fact, those are the two primary reasons for becoming a Christian. And then if you said to me, what have you got now? My understanding was that God had given to me what I, what I can only describe as a mail order catalog called the Bible. Which had a list of all the good things I could get from God. And God in heaven had a sort of spiritual supermarket with shelves crammed full of goodies. And I was to put in my order, which is called praying. And... God would send an errand boy called the Holy Spirit who would deliver the goods. So for an example, I read my catalog and find out I can have some love. Lord, I need some love. Please give me some love. And I imagine the Holy Spirit coming with a tube of love, a little bit like toothpaste, take off the top, squeeze down on my inside and go, oh, lovey, for a little while. <laughs> and then it would wear off. I'd read the catalog. I can have some joy. Lord, give me some joy. I imagine a bottle of Joy, a bit like a bubble bath mixture, give it a good shake, take the top off, pour it on my inside, and boo, joyful for a little while. And that would wear off. I read the catalogue. Lord, I can have some peace. Please give me some peace. I'm a bit uptight at the moment. And I imagine the Holy Spirit coming with a tin of peace, a bit like a thick molasses, take the lid off, pour it on my inside, and go, oh, peace. Then I read the catalogue and find out I can have some power. Lord, I need some power. Please give me some power. And I imagine the Holy Spirit coming with a stick of power, lighting the blue fuse and standing back and suddenly, boom, and there's power, which would also wear off after a while. In the first years of my Christian, I was always asking God for things. Give me this, give me that, I need the other. 
But one of the most transforming moments in my Christian life, the most transforming moment, was when I made discoveries which included at the heart of it that when I became a Christian, God had only one thing to give to me. He gave me himself. That Jesus Christ had actually come to live within me. This was not a metaphor. This is reality. Somebody said to me this morning, this is a great concept. I said, it's not a concept. This piano is not a concept. It's a real thing. This is a real thing. It's not, a, it's not a doctrine, it's spiritual reality that Jesus Christ himself actually indwells us. And if we don't live in the light of that, in the good of that, in dependence on that, our Christian life will always be pushing a bus up a hill. And you wonder why it doesn't work. And you start to pretend like everybody else that you look around, you assume is pretending. And you know how, when you're pretending, because what you claim on Sunday will not work on Monday. And your wife will know that. And your kids will know that. This is the actual substance of the gospel. That Jesus Christ himself, by his Holy Spirit, lives within us. And when you have Christ in you, you have everything that God has to give to you. That's why in Colossians 2, verse 2, next chapter there. And second part of that verse, that we may know the mystery, that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Everything else is wrapped up in him. Ephesians 1 verse 3 says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. What's missing from that? Everything that God has to give you is in Christ. 2 Peter 1 verse 3, His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of Christ, who called us by his own glory and goodness. Everything we need, he says, for life, everything we need for godliness, we, we have where? In Christ. This is why Paul calls this the word of God in its fullness. This is the criteria by which the rest of Scripture is to be understood. In the experiential nature of what it means to be a Christian. And to live the Christian life. That's why disciples were never called followers of Jesus after Pentecost. It was an appropriate description before Pentecost because that's all that was available. So Jesus said, follow me. That was all that was available. But something happened to Pentecost. He's with you. He will be in you. Stop following him around now. You're not followers anymore. You're in Christ and Christ is in you. If I put my hand into a glove, my hand becomes the strength of the glove. The glove doesn't follow the hand around. The glove simply yields itself to the indwelling hand, if you like. And operates in dependency on it. That's why after the cross and the resurrection and our union with Christ in his death and resurrection, as Paul says in Galatians 2, I've been crucified with Christ. I recognize his death was my death. I was united with him in death. And I no longer live because I've been crucified. But Christ lives in me. The explanation of my life now is my union with Christ. And in Colossians 3, in verse 3, he speaks there of Christ who is your life. And yet so often we know by the way we speak that we don't grasp this. I'm forever hearing people praying things to God like this. Lord, please be with me today. They haven't begun to understand the Christian life. Lord, please be with us in this meeting. You haven't begun to understand the Christian life. Because the point is, he is here. He does indwell us. That's your starting point. That's not the object, well, get him to be here today. That's the starting point. Because you're here, Lord Jesus, I can rest in everything you want to do. So it's about a person... Christ, a place, in you. Thirdly, it's about a purpose. Christ in you, the hope of glory. What is glory? 
Well, let me say what it isn't, first of all. In evangelical slang, we sort of talk about people who die and go to glory as though it's a name for heaven. That is not a use in scripture. There is a variation of meaning to the word glory. Heaven is never one of its meanings. Heaven will be glorious, of course. But essentially, glory is the moral character of God. What is our biggest problem? Well, of course, it is our sin. What is sin? Sin, the word itself, and I've mentioned this many times, is to come short of a target. It was used in archery. You miss the uh, target. It was called sin. You miss it. What is sin in human experience missing? What is the mark that we miss? Well, Romans 3.23 tells us, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's the mark that we've missed. In other words, we are created to display the glory of God, as we saw a little bit last week, the character of God. But we don't. We've come short of that. And so in Hebrews 1 verse 3, Paul writes, the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. Now he says, here in Jesus Christ, you have the expression, the radiance of God's glory. You know what his glory is, what his character is. You have the exact representation of his being. When you look at Jesus, you know what God is like, his father is like. We talked about this last week when he was described in verse 15 of Colossians 1 as being in the image, as being the image of the invisible God. A description first given to Adam. Adam was created to be in the image of God. But we fell. We're born, born into our fallen condition, having come short of the glory of God. So what is the solution? What has been hidden for ages and generations is this. So Christ in you is your hope of hitting the target. Of being restored into the image of God. Your hope of glory... Now it has a future dimension, of course. That's why he says your hope. It is a progression, a hope, an anticipation, a moving. We're being transformed from one degree of glory into another, into his image, as Paul wrote to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. There is growth in that. It is your hope. In this life, we live with the battle between the flesh and the spirit, and that's a battle we engage in every day. In fact, we fight against the world, the flesh, and the devil. But there is a growth in godliness until, as Colossians says, when Christ who is our life shall appear, then we shall also appear with him in glory. Again, that's not a place. But when Christ our life appears, that is when he becomes like us, visibly we will see him on that great day when he's coming back. We too should become like him. And we shall appear glorified. In glory. So whereas it's not as valid biblically to talk about people dying and going to glory, a place, it is valid to talk about people being restored to glory when they die because they will go to be restored to that condition in which Adam was first created. So the fullness of the gospel has been a mystery. It is all about Christ himself, not simply giving some rules and some laws as God gave in the Old Testament, which reveal his own character, but it's much deeper, much deeper than that. It's going to be Christ in you, and it's going to be in him your hope, your means of being restored into his image. And Christ's likeness is never arrived at by imitating Christ. It is Christ himself expressing himself through us, which is why it'll be when you least think it is and are most unexpecting of it. You know, if you try to be like Jesus, you'll probably almost certainly start playing a game. But if instead you live in dependence upon Jesus and in love for him and in obedience to him, your preoccupation is him, you'll begin to be like him. Because he in you will 
express himself and his character, his glory, will start to be restored into our lives. So being like Christ is not by imitation, it's actually a derived likeness. It comes from Christ himself operating within us. But there's a fourth thing. It's about a person, about a place, about a purpose. It's also about an appropriation. How do we appropriate this? That is, how do we live in the good of this? Let me read verse 28 and 29. We proclaim him. That's our message. We proclaim Christ. Admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so we may present everyone perfect in Christ. Meaning, as the word perfect often does in scripture, not with perfection or being morally perfect, but with all the resources that are available to us in Christ. We present everyone living in dependence on him. That is like presenting a car with a full tank. It may be a 20-year-old car, but it has a full tank. It functions. may have lots about it that isn't ideal. But it's perfect in the sense that it's filled. This is the fullness of one of Paul's words. But now he says, present perfect in Christ. That is, that I present... We proclaim Christ, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom that they, we may present everyone perfect in Christ, living on a full tank. And then he says this, to this end, I labor, struggling with all his energy, which so powerfully works in me. Now, notice the words he uses here. To this end, I labor, struggling. You say, well, I, I thought those words, from what you're saying, Christ is in you as your life and your strength, that those words will go out of the window. But not so. I labor, I struggle. In chapter 2, verse 1, he says, I want you to know how much I'm struggling for you and for those at Laodicea, which was a church down the road from Colossae. But notice this, to this end I labor, struggling with all his energy, which so powerfully works in me. Mine is the labor, mine is the struggle, mine is the discipline, mine is the battle, mine is the hard work, but his is the energy. And I live in his energy, he says. How does this work? I've said this a thousand times. We live in dependence on God, on Jesus Christ, on his indwelling Holy Spirit. Let's not divide the Trinity up because, you know, when Paul Ephesians, you talk about the fullness of God and arriving at the statue of the fullness of Christ. He said, be filled with the Spirit. Though the focus is actually Christ because the Holy Spirit bears witness to Christ and glorifies Christ and takes our attention to Christ and we know Christ the man who walked on earth we have the four gospels that tell us about who this Jesus Christ is and that's the one who comes by his spirit to live within us we live in dependence on him and obedience to him and of course those two are always in love for him and we rest I love the way the Amplified Bible translates Philippians 4.13. In many translations, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The Amplified Bible, as its name suggests, takes different facets of the meaning. There's no exact equivalent of one language to another. And what is contained within this Greek text using many English words. It's cumbersome to read, but it has some wonderful insights. And I love this verse, Philippians 4.13. And the Bible says, I have the strength, I have strength for all things in Christ who empowers me. I am ready for anything and equal to everything through him who infuses inner strength into me. That is, I am self-sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. I have a full tank. 
I have strength for all things in Christ who empowers me. I'm ready for anything. I'm equal to everything through him who infuses the inner strength. I'm self-sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. Is that true for you? You know, the appropriation of this, the obedience is the labor, the struggle, the dependence is the resting and the assurance of his presence within us, working through us, is sometimes this appropriation is in cold-blooded trust. I can't think of a better word, better way to express it. Many of you know the writings of Oswald Chambers, especially his book of daily devotional writings, uh, My Utmost for His Highest. I've read that for many years, and I love Oswald Chambers' writings. He always takes you back to Jesus. I, I read recently his biography. When he was a boy, he became a Christian. Years later, he was a, a student at a college in Dunoon in Scotland. And he writes that despite his love for Jesus, I had no conscious communion with him. The Bible was the dullest, most uninteresting book in existence. He writes later, I was getting very desperate. I knew no one who had what I wanted. But I knew that if what I had was all the Christianity there was, the thing was a fraud. Then he writes of being at a meeting when a well-known speaker talked about taking God at his word and appropriating his indwelling presence. And he writes of the consequence of that meeting, I felt nothing, but I knew emphatically that my time had come. I had no vision of God, only a sheer dogged determination to take God at his word and to prove this thing for myself. I had no vision of heaven or angels. I had nothing. I was as dry and empty as ever. Then I was asked to speak at a meeting and I just trusted Christ to work, almost in cold blood. And 40 souls came to Christ. I was terrified. I went to a friend and I told him what had happened. And he said, don't you remember claiming the presence and working of Jesus on the basis of the word of God? Then like a flash, something happened inside me and I saw that I'd been wanting power in my own hand, so to speak, that I might say, look what I am doing. And by the way, that's a sure qualification for getting nowhere. I want this to make me look good. And then he writes this. If the four previous years had been hell on earth, these five years, which is evidently when he wrote this, these five years have truly been heaven on earth. Glory to God. The last aching abyss of the human heart is filled to overflowing with the love of God. After he comes in, all you see is Jesus. Jesus only. Jesus ever and that resonated so much with me because of my own walk with God and of course we're all different we all have different turning points in our life but I remember coming to a point of saying to God I cannot live the Christian life I knew I loved him and it was through my tears I said, I do love you. But I, I can't live the life. It's too difficult. Too hard. And it was at that point I came to understand. Through various means. Of course you can't live the life. All God expects of you is failure. Without me you can do nothing. And I was spending all my energy doing nothing because I was doing it for Jesus. And learned to say, Lord Jesus, my life is yours. My body is yours. My heart is your home. I'm going to trust you. And the whole of the Christian life turned around.
Of course, as Paul says, I labor, I struggle, I battle, but in his energy. And you discover you have energy you never thought you had. Because it's divine energy. And I take you back to what's the most important thing to understand about this statement of Paul. He says, this is the word of God in its fullness. This is not an emphasis. This is not a dimension. This is not semantics. This is the truth. For which the whole of the rest of scripture will come alive as the mystery is cracked and broken open. And you go back and you find the tabernacle is all about Christ. The law was actually all about Christ. The whole story makes sense. The word of God in its fullness of which I'm a servant, says Paul, involves this mystery hidden for ages. Now at last made known. Now at last cracks everything open. Christ, the focal point, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. The mystery, namely Christ, he says in the next chapter. Christ in you. Quit trying to live for him. Let him live in you. In trust and dependence. It'll be a hope of glory. You'll expect things to happen. In your labor, your struggle, your battle, but in divine energy. Do you know those of us who will get this most are those of us who are willing to recognize that we are exhausted, burned out, in many cases, on our backs. We just can't do it. If you haven't reached that point, it won't make a lot of sense because actually that is God's pattern again and again in Scripture. When people run out of their own steam, that's when they discover the fullness and sufficiency of the life of God indwelling them. Are you willing this morning to say, Lord Jesus, forgive me. I've thought of you as out there, up there. And of course, the main dimensions to the position and work and place of Christ on the right hand of the Father, all of that is true. But the experiential content of the Christian life is his life imparted to us lived in us and you simply say Lord I trust you I rest in you thank you you are my sufficiency you're my strength I obey you that's a labor that's a struggle that's the hard work but I trust you that's the flow of life that you'll bring through me wherever I am as you work let's pray together I want to ask that maybe in a moment of quietness if your Christian life has been pushing a bus up a hill it's probably because you've been trying to do it yourself. Maybe God has spoken to you this morning and said stop, quit. Recognize I can't, but Jesus can. And live every day in dependence upon him. In that attitude of rest in him, where you can be as busy as you've ever been. Struggle as you've ever struggled in many senses, but now with energy. Because you relate everything to him and say, Lord, this is your business. And Lord Jesus, I pray for each one of us here. Thank you for your own timetable in our lives where you bring us to a point of realizing without you we can do nothing. We may have known this, the text. 
but we've not believed it. In the deepest recesses of our hearts, we've just tried to do our best. Instead, Lord Jesus, thank you that you are our life. You are our strength. You are made unto us our wisdom. You are our energy. We want to live in dependence upon you, in obedience to you, out of deep love for you, that our lives may again become an exhibition of yourself, something of what Jesus is like might be displayed in us. We thank you for this potential and thank you for the day where it's sooner or later when we will be glorified when Christ who is our life shall appear and we will become like him in glory fully restored to be the people you created us to be. Help us, Lord, to grasp this. Help us to live within it. Help us not to make it complicated. Help us to realize it's just being childlike in dependence and just assuming, just assuming you'll be as good as you said you would be and getting on with life. And thank you for the blessing that will flow. In Jesus' name, amen.